नमस्कार वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू वन एंड ऑल जॉइन इन दर्चुअल प्लेटफॉर्म इन आवर सेकेंड डे ऑफ आवर थ्री डेज सीरीज डेज रेस्पेक्टेड टू डेज रिसोर्स पर्सन सी एम ए बी के दस सर ग्रुप जनरल मैनेजर ऑफ फाइनेंस नालको लिमिटेड सेंट्रल काउंसिल मेम्बर ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूट पास चेयरमैन ऑफ द चैप्टर एंड ई आई आर सी रिजनल काउंसिल मेम्बर्स एस टी मेम्बर्स एंड स्टेक होल्डर्स एंड माइंड सी एम एस चेयरमैन ऑफ द चैप्टर सी एम ए हिमज मिश्र सेक्रेटरी सी एम ए सूर्य नारायण त्रिपाठी एंड ऑल माई प्रोफेसनाल कलिग्स इन द मैनेजिंग कमिटी आई ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ मैनेजिंग कमिटी वार्मली वेलकम्स यू ऑल टू द सेकेंड डे ऑफ थ्री डेज सीरीज ऑफ ओविनी ऑन इंडेस Today we have with us very learned resource person, C M A B K Das sir, who will deliver on three index, that is index two inventory, index sixteen property, plant and equipment, index thirty eight intangible assets. Hope this will be an another learning session for all of us. It is my great pleasure to introduce the today's resource person. Before that. I would like to request our official to play the institute anthem. person cma bikeda sir is a post graduate in commerce and graduate in law and a fellow member of the institute of cost accountants of india having more than 30 years of experience in finance and accounts in different positions in different industries he is also a member of board of studies in utkal university odisha he is a visiting faculty member of the institute of cost accountants of india institute of company secretary of india and different management institutes <clears throat> he started his career in early 90s in a pharmaceutical company thereafter switched over to siram pistol and rings limited and finally in national aluminum company nalco in the year 1994 at present he is in the position of group general manager finance Mines and Refining Complex, National Aluminium Company Limited. The job profile includes corporate accounts, internal financial control, cost management, compliance to LODR, project finance, budgeted budgetary control, taxation, etc. Also, an I'll give you call. I'll give you call, of course. I mean, okay. Hello. Also, an active core team member in implementation of ICO module in SR SAP ERP of Nalco. Thank you, sir, for acceptance of our invitation. Thank you for your continued support, love, and affection shown to Bhuvaneswar chapter, maybe for students program or maybe for members program. Tomorrow. we will have the opportunity to listen from the expert on indes cma dr gopal krishna raju sir from chennai who is regularly delivering on indes in our institute program so all are requested to join with the same time and same link tomorrow to make our event a grand success without taking much time now i request our chairman sri himaj mishra to address 
Thank you, Shakti sir. Namaskar, Das sir. Namaskar. Namaskar to all who have joined in the two days series of webnet on Indies. I C M Himoj Misra, Chairman of Bhuneshwar Chapter, feel privileged to welcome you all again to today's webnet on the area to be discussed on Indies two. 16 and 38 my sincere thanks and insightful gratitude to the respected resource person cma bk dasar for acceptance of our invitation in virtual platform in spite of his busy schedule esteemed cma participants cma sakthidhar singh sir chairman pt committee cma surjanarayan tripathi sir secretary of the chapter professional colleagues in the management committee and stakeholder i once again welcome you all dear professional friends teamwork is the ability to work together towards a common vision the ability to direct individual accomplishment towards organizational objective it is the fuel that allow common people to attain on common results thank you all for extending team support by joining in the day 2 of 3 days webnet on indes hope today deliberation and interaction with cma bk das sir shall be learning session for all of us thank you all jay jagannath thanks uh, cma himaj misra chairman of the chapter now i would like to request cma bk das sir sir kindly start this session good evening shubha sandhya good evening chairman secretary office bearers of the chapter our friends in this uh, icai fraternity members from the industry and the business houses first of all i'll uh, thank the chapter for arranging such programs for enlightening the members in the various fields of this uh, indes for right implementation no doubt we are working in our own field but at the same time the knowledge uh, earning has no limitation we can add the values whatever experience will gather definitely would help a lot so again my thanks to the chapter office bearers and the bonus uh, particularly the bonus or chapter organizing this uh, three days uh, webnet about the relevance of the topic when i was asked sir uh, what you like to take normally i like all the accounting standards these are part of our life but being in the industry i selected particularly these two indes system indes 2 and also the intangibles because these are cost mostly related to the manufacturing industries and uh, has a lot of implication and lot of interpretations it varies from practice to practice depending from the industry to industry whatever it is given in the academic that is in a straight way a principle based something like that but when the practice when the, uh, industry practice differs from industry to industry then you have to interpret in the right form for its right application so definitely will cover the particularly the two important tangible items in the balance sheet the property plant and equipment and inventory we have to deliver it lot and if time permits then also we cover will cover the intangibles but mostly the thrust will be on the property plant and equipment and the inventory i have two requests to the all the participants number one let us complete this presentation or the deliberation and whatever the doubts will come to your mind please take a note of it we will completely discuss about the doubts or the questions if any after the deliberation is over there is a clear question answer session and in that meeting we will i'll from my side i'll try to my best to satisfy you with the questions you will be having and with that let us start first the indes system so coming to the property plant and equipment 
if we'll correlate to the past, let us come out of the academic for a little while. Earlier, we call it the fixed assets. There are in the earlier accounting standard, index 10 and index 6. Index 6, uh, sorry, AS, accounting standard 6, it was covering the depreciation and accounting standard 10, it is covering the fixed assets. Now 10 plus 6, 6 now it is 16. So now it is combined property, plant and equipment. It covers both your tangible fixed assets as well as its depreciation. So what we'll cover today, normally the recognition, particularly whenever we are discussing any property, plant and equipment, the basic question comes, what is the modality of recognition and its measurement criteria? Then what is the modality of depreciation? What is the nature of impairment? And when the one will have to de-recognize it, and what is the right of procedure? What is the accounting treatment? And what is the disclosure and the compliance requirement? All the things we'll cover one by one. So let us first see what is this uh, property, plant, and equipment. Earlier it was fixed asset. How it differs to rename it as a property, plant, and equipment? So if you go by the definition, this property, plant, and equipment these are first of all tangible assets. Because now intangible has been made different under a different accounting standard. So property, plant, and equipment only cover the tangible items, those are assets. And those are held in the use of production or supply of goods or services or for rental to others or for administrative purposes. In our earlier days, when we have been taught how you will differentiate between a capital expenditure and a revenue expenditure, this is a very simple question to all the beginners, how to identify between a revenue expenditure and a capital expenditure. Simply, we can tell that revenue expenditure, which is charged to profit and loss account, capital expenditure, which is, is maintained in the balance sheet, and now it is in the property, plant, and equipment. That means it helps in production. But the, all the revenue expenditure itself is converted into the produ production. That means all the factors of cost of expenditure is converted to give an output, which is being sold to earn the revenue. But here, the property, plant, and equipment is used in the production or supply of goods. That means which helps in generating revenue. That is the basic difference. That means the property, plant, and equipment, these are the tangible items. And these are held in the use of, in the process, production process, or the for supply of goods and services, or for rental to others, or for administrative purposes. And these benefits are expected to be used during more than one period. What is the relevance of this one period? More than one, if the benefit, whatever we will be getting, will be consuming within one year. So definitely what will happen, it entire thing will be depreciated also in the one year. So at least to get its differentiation, the two important meaning they have given to the definition, that means that it must be a tangible asset. It is held for the use in the production or supply of goods and services. And these benefits are expected to be used or the items are to be expected to be used more than or more than one period. Now the question comes, what is an asset? It is telling that it is a tangible asset. Then if we'll go to define asset, then asset is a resource that is controlled by an entity as a result of past events. There are certain past events which has caused this asset and this asset is controlled or owned by me. Then the, what is the meaning of control? The meaning of control is that ownership, denying access to others, then I have the control. I am having a piece of land. When I can tell that I am having the control, when I have the authority to deny the access to others, that means the single authority to uh, have the enjoy the ownership. So controlled by an entity as a result of past events and from which future economic benefits are expected to flow. So asset two relevant points are there. One thing is the controlling, controlled by an entity. Second thing, there must be future economic benefit. Unless future economic benefits are there, I cannot continue this as in the asset in the financial statements. Now, when we have to recognize this, now we have understood that it must be a tangible item as an asset. Then what is an asset also we have discussed. Now we can see what is the recognition criteria? That the cost of an item of property, plant and equipment should be recognized if and only if. That means necessary conditions. If it is probable that future economic benefits associated with the item will flow to the entity. That means future economic benefit is a mandatory condition to recognize the item as property, plant, and equipment. Second thing, the cost of the item can be measured reliably. In all the accounting standards, wherever the accounting comes, the measurement criteria speaks 
that the item must be measured reliably. Hypothetically, I cannot take any value. It is not a theory. Some quantification mechanism must be there and value you can assign. So the cost of the item can be measured reliably. So if these two conditions are fulfilled and it is a tangible asset, then it can be defined as a property, plant and equipment. There are some other elements. Normally, when we are talking of property, plant and equipment, we speak of plant and machinery, furniture, fixture, building. But with the introduction of this index system, now there are certain spare parts or standby equipment or servicing equipment that also we can consider as a part of property, plant and equipment, provided they fulfill the criteria different in the as index two, uh, index uh, system. The criteria is that the life or the useful life or the benefit must be more than one year. There must be future economic benefit and the benefit must be more than one year. So any spare part, if it is giving a value of more than one year, definitely will bring and whatever spare we are having, definitely there is a future economic benefit, otherwise you will not procure it. But once it is procured, question comes whether all the spare parts we are having in the plant, that will be taken as a part of my property plant equipment. Then I have to apply the materiality concept. Suppose you are taking a screw nut. The amount is 50 rupees or 100 rupees. I know that once I'm putting this uh, screw nut in the machine, it will continue for three years. But can I, should I continue that item as a property plant equipment? Then I have to apply the materiality concept. So, so I have to re reduce the workload. Or the cost of accounting should not be more than the cost of benefit that I'm going getting out of it. So but based on the materiality criteria, I am reducing the numbers so that the weightage will be given to the value of spare parts and the standby equipment or any servicing equipment. Now we'll call that, uh, but now the question is that when we'll start recognize this, an entity should evaluate under the recognized principle all the property, plant, and equipments at the time they're incurred. So I'll put the value on the plant or property, plant, and equipment on the respective GL account when the expenditure is incurred. And the cost includes, the cost include initially to acquire the construction of an item of property plant equipment and cost includes subsequently also. Suppose initially I made a plant and machinery. The amount is 100 crores. Whatever cost include initially, the detailed elements of cost we will discuss afterwards. So whatever the initial cost it is there, I will take it. In addition to that, if there is a subsequent addition also or improvement also, that will also form part of my property plant and equipment. What is not covered in the index, there is the exclusion clause. Normally, any um, fixed assets or the property, plant, and equipment retired from active use and held for sale, this will not be grouped under this property, plant, and equipment because the purpose is very different. Whatever the items written up from the books are not having active use or retired from active use, those are only held for sale. That means the future economic benefit of that item is not as intended for that fixed asset. So that will not be constituted or not be coming under index system, rather to be covered under index 105. Secondly, the biological assets related to agricultural activity, these are covered under separate index, so not covered under index system. Similarly, the exploration and the evaluation of mineral resources, the mineral rights and mineral reserves, these are covered under separate accounting standard. So this is also excluded from the purview of index system. Now question comes, what is this? Sorry. What is this class of PP? Why in the accounting standard, in the uh, companies act, they have mentioned a class of PP. Why, what is the class of property plant and equipment? What it is essentially? Whenever you, you see in the uh, companies act, schedule three, they have defined the way or what are the nature of items to be reported in the financial statement. We are having varieties of asset, but for a common reporting or a uniform reporting, we have to group it under the categories, whatever it has been defined in the company chart. So the class of property plant equipment is a grouping of asset of similar nature and used in an entity's operation primarily for uniform reporting in the financial statement. Certain items as uh, 
notified in the by MCA in the Companies Act. It is the land, building, machinery, plant and machineries, motor vehicles, furniture fittings, other equipment. So whatever assets you will be adding to our operation, those will be categorized under these major heads so as to enable us for appropriate reporting in the financial statement. That's the very basic objective of the class of property, plant and equipment. Coming to the model, there are two models available in India system. Either we can go for a cost model or a revaluation model. The cost model mostly based on the historical cost data, whatever we are carrying forward from year to year. And revaluation model, it is a fair valuation method. And to the best of my knowledge, most of the Indian industries, they have preferred the cost model because the continuing companies, it is easy to get the historical cost of the asset as on the date of implementation of Windows and carrying forward that net value of the asset as the opening balance to go ahead. So the cost model normally we are referring. Coming to the elements of cost, you know, what are the items those we can consider as a part in the property planted equipment? An item of property planted equipment that qualifies for recognition of assets should be measured at its cost that we know. And the cost of item that comprises, first is the purchase price. If I'm purchasing any of the equipment or any, any item purchasing, including import duties and non-refundable purchase taxes after deduction of trade discount and reverse, that means landed cost of the purchase item, net of tax credit. It may be input tax credit, it may be any form of discount or rebate. Whatever the landed cost of the purchase items, that is the principal value that I have to consider for the purpose of property planted equipment. In addition to that, any cost directly attributable to bringing the asset to the location and condition necessary for it to be capable of operating in the manner intended by the management. In all the doubts or in all the questions related to property, plant and equipment recognition, this particular line you must be getting either by the clarification by the institute or by the industry. That means the very particular sentence that to bring the asset to the location and condition necessary for it to be capable of operating in the manner intended by the management. I have got an equipment, but suppose I want to put a um, put my boiler. I have purchased the boiler. The total cost of boiler is 300 crores. Is it the only cost of PPE? No. My intention is to put the boiler in a usable condition which will generate power. So till the time it is available, for generation of power, everything is to be considered as the cost directly attributable to it. So any cost directly, what is my intention? Intention is to put a power plant or a PG turbo generator who will give me the power generation. So till the time the power generation is ready to be generated, whatever cost involved, including its purchase price, that is to be taken as a part of the cost of the property planted equipment. These are purchase price, or directly attributable, these are based on the cash outflow or the expenditure side. In addition to that, India's system has mandated a new item called dismantling obligation. What happens over the years, taking into consideration the green environment, it is the obligation, it, is, it may be a social obligation, but afterwards it has become a legal obligation also. It has become a social obligation that whatever destruction we are making to the mother earth if we are dispensing or discontinuing the business operation we have to leave, we have to leave the mother earth as is before putting the plant whatever the nature of land it was there it is my responsibility to see that i am allowing the mother earth to remain as it is that means i have to dismantle the plant and to leave earth is, as is definitely the dismantling on a subsequent period will have some cost. That cost is to be assessed today and also to be added to the cost of property planted equipment. This is a new item introduced in India's system. The property planted equipment, that means you have to foresee what is the dismantling cost today if you are putting a plant, commissioning a new plant, the dismantling may happen after 30, 40 years. You don't know exactly when it will happen. But Taking that into consideration, you have to take a factor, you have to take a price of dismantling and ascertain the liability and put that cost as a part of your property, plant and equipment costs. 
some of the direct attribute one purchase point purchase cost uh, it is uh, already identified one to one because equipment purchase machinery purchase table furniture purchase this is one to one identified but normally the doubt comes what are the other cost that we can add to the property plant and equipment so directly attributable cost first of all it is the cost of employee benefit arising directly from the construction or acquisition of the property plant and equipment for example we are in the, um, there are two things one is the continuous ongoing plant uh, having expansion projects and there is a new greenfield project in case of a greenfield project everything sorry it is missing in a greenfield project everything all employee benefits it's part of the project cost because without those people you cannot bring the project into its existence but in case of a brownfield expansion or the expansion project of the existing continuing plant you have to clearly demarcate whatever the existing employees for your existing operation and whatever the dedicated employee for the project team suppose a company is going for its expansion project and for expansion project definitely requires a dedicated project people to bring the project whatever the expansion project you have envisaged their activity their role is different from that of operation so even though they either they can be newly recruited or they can be part of your existing team if they are of the part of the existing team you have to make them separate as a separate cost center or separate identifiable component to take that group as a directly involved for bringing that project so accordingly that cost of employee benefits which is directly from the construction of or acquisition of the property plant and equipment that can be eligible to be part of your property plant and equipment second is the cost of site preparation we know this is agreed this is taken into consideration initial delivery and handling cost this is also taken into consideration cost of testing all the things we know professional fees or consultancy all the things these are directly attributable cost dismantling restoration obligation already we have known only one thing i have to say this dismantling or restoration obligation this is coming either in the form of a contractual obligation or of a statutory obligation just two small examples i'll give in case of contractual obligation how it happens in case suppose i am having a lease deed in case of a lease deed whatever things i am having there is a defined lease period and in the lease document it is mentioned that the government of odisha has allowed me use this piece of land for a period of 99 years under certain terms and condition and in the terms and condition it is mentioned that i am allowing you this piece of land for purpose of your business after the business is over or after the lease period is over unless it is renewed you will hand over the land back to government as is where this is that means as is where on the original position whatever you have taken in that shape you have to give that means the company has a contractual obligation to recognize the asset restoration obligation or the dismantling obligation as a part of the condition specified in the lease deed other than that there are other statutory obligation also like in the mmdr act what happens those who are working the mines they must be knowing in the mmdr act there are certain mines closure activity mandated like after exhibition of the mother earth or the exhibition of the ore you are again to fill back the soil you have to make a plantation you have to make a fencing all the parts are coming under mmdr act you may be doing it after 5 10 years of your operation or mining but once you are disturbing the mother earth you have the obligation to provide it a liability to be settled or to be liquidated on a later date when you will take the action so that's why this is just to inform about the nature of the asset restoration obligation these are the new introduction in the indes and everybody should take a note of it whatever the contractual whatever the statutory obligation we do have we must have to comply it and we have to take necessary provisions or the liabilities in the books of accounts there are certain exclusion from the cost of pp this is opening a new facility introducing a new product or services particularly the advertising not nature of things cost of conducting business in no location administration and other general overhead cost that's these are certain cost but just i want to focus on one item like administration and other general overhead cost in general the administration cost is not taken as part of pp but if it is directly attributable to bring that asset without which the asset cannot come to you suppose there is a project certain you for project commissioning you require certain amount to be paid or certain expenditure is to be made 
with the pollution control board or the forest department, there are forest clearance required, there are environment clearance required, there are pollution control clearance is required. And for that purpose, you have to spend some administrative expenses. That's because those are directly attributable, without which the project will not come into existence. Those nature of administrative expenses can be part, should be construed as a part of your property, plant, and equipment cost. Now, the recognition to what extent we can the cost to be recognized. So, if you strictly speaking, there is no debt of capitalization like a terminology in the account dictionary. No heritage tells that the debt of capitalization is this and this. They are telling to what extent you can consider the cost to be recognized as a part of EP and when your depreciation starts. So recognition of cost in the carrying amount of PP CJs, again the same, when the item is available in the location and condition necessary for it to be capable of operating in the manner intended by the management. If I have envisaged a building of 200 uh, square feet size or 2,000 square feet size or 3,000 square feet size completely to be occupied by me with all furniture, furniture, fitting, everything. That means till the time everything is completed, this item will be construed as accruing the cost from time to time when it is decided that yes, now the asset is ready for put to use by me as intended or as envisaged by me. Is an AK year ending okay? Any building ka roof ho gaya, to that extent I will recognize and I will capitalize. No. Whatever I am in which I am asking for a complete building to be made available to me for use for my office purpose. So whatever I am envisaging, till the time it is completed, all the cost involved therein is to be forming part of your building cost. Certain practical issue. Just because these are what we have discussed, these are mostly the part of the accounting standard. Just for the knowledge of the participants, since I am from the industry, whatever the problems you are facing, similar problems also must be faced face by the other participants who are working in the industry or also practicing. So for small, some clarification, some treatment of specific items before going to further depreciation, compliance, all the things, Certain um, specific items let us discuss that will widen our knowledge on the various fields. One thing is that accounting treatment of small value items. What happens? There are certain capital items. The item is capital. Its useful life is more than one year. But a uh, value is 5,000, 5, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. What will happen? It's over the accounting treatment. It is not spare part. These are movable fixed asset. Take the case of Godrej's furniture. Godre chair today, if you will take, suppose one Godre chair is 10,000 rupees and having 2,000 2, uh, Godre chairs. Whether I should uh, capitalize it or uh, I should uh, charge to revenue? Normally, it should be taken as a fixed assets or the property, plant, and equipment because it has the future economic benefit and its value, uh, uh, this uh, life is more than one year. At the same time, as a professional accountant, always you should suggest as a part of internal control that it should be taken into the asset. It may so happen, you can take an accounting policy that items having small value can have 100% depreciation in the year of acquisition. Nobody will have comments. But if you will take these items out of the uh, capital, um, this uh, purview of capitalization of uh, this asset and will take a revenue item, that will not, perhaps this will be a violation of your accounting standard and there will be loss of internal control of such items. Once these items are coming to the fixed asset, as a compliance to CARO, all movable fixed assets are subject to physical verification. So even though chairs, tables, those are mostly prone to loss or missing. So once you are bringing to the uh, fixed asset register, the stock welfare or the asset welfare of the company, uh, we'll take a note of that and we'll verify whether those items are lying in the way, um, elsewhere in the plant or it is missing so that a proper report will come to the management. So this will be my suggestion that for the small value items, depending on the materiality concept, depending on the size of the business of your company, you can take a call if you can provide 100% depreciation, but to be taken as a capital item. Now, the second issue is that Commissioning and one operation maintenance pairs procured along with project package. Those who are working in the project, normally what happens to take care of our spares, whenever we are giving a project package, we keep an order for the commissioning spare as well as the one spare. Because 
whenever I'm going to a vendor to have my plant and machinery, after commissioning is over, I should not be blackmailed or I should not be put under pressure or purchase of spare for those plant and machinery. So whenever I'm giving a project contract, also I'm giving a parallel contract, either included in the same contract or separately, to have that commission spare or one spare. Now question comes, what will be the accounting treatment? Suppose contract is one. The contract is for 300 crores and that includes 10 crores of operation and maintenance spares. As because contract is one, should I capitalize the entire value? No. Because what is the very purpose of the operation and maintenance spares? These spares are procured to take care of your spares requirement post commissioning. Post commissioning means the operational period. That is beyond the trial period or the project period. So all one spares to be formed part of inventory, not a part of capital cost. But so far as commissioning spare, these spares are intentionally procured to be used during the period of commissioning. So as we have defined any expenditure, I am doing for bringing the asset into their location and condition as intended by management. My intention is to put the plant in its operating condition. So till the time of putting the plant in the operation condition, whatever commission is where I require, that will form part of your property plant and equipment. Now the third item, abnormal loss. Suppose during the course of transit or in the course of commissioning, there is some fire, hurt, or damage. Whether that abnormal loss should form part of the property, property plant and equipment? No. As per the accounting standard in this system, this abnormal loss should not form part of your this uh, property plant and equipment because this loss has nothing to do with the bring to bring the plant. You may have a replacement, but this loss has no link to bring to the plant in the location and condition. And this abnormal loss should be excluded from the cost of your property plant and equipment. Another general question comes, what is the liquidity damage or the price reduction clause? Sometimes what happens, there is a schedule completion period of three years or two years, for the time in three years. And the vendor could not complete the assignment. Though the project vendor tha, he could not complete, he took it four years. And the four years, there is, a, as per the contract clause, there is a condition for liquidity damage or the price reduction. That means if beyond delivery date, there is a delay, for each period, some specified percentage will be deducted from the contract value. Now, whether this liquidity damage, because once I'm recurring on the contract value, now the payable amount to the vendor is reduced. This liquidity damage amount, whatever I'm recovering from the vendor, whether that should form part of the property plant equipment or it will be charged to revenue. Now the question is that, is the interpretation to be taken by the EIC or the project manager or the project finance team, whether this extension of the contract period has led to increase in the project cost, either due to time overrun or cost overrun. If there is a significant measurable time overrun and cost overrun and can be quantified, any liquidated damage you have recovered from the vendor such due to such delay can be adjusted or can be reduced from the project cost. Because whatever extra implication you have taken in the project cost due to delay, to that extent you are recovering. So you have to adjust the LD amount whatever you are recovering due to this extension of the period for which the company has suffered extra financial implication due to the time overrun and the cost overrun. Next question is that the borrowing cost or the equity investment. First of all, is the borrowing cost element, eh? now there is a debate. What is the truly the borrowing cost? Is, there is a separate account standard to deal with the borrowing cost. So for a qualifying asset, during the construction period, if I have borrowed some money, whatever amount of interest or the financial cost is there, that will form part of my property, plant and equipment. That is for the qualifying asset and the qualifying period. And that interest element or the financial cost will form part of the borrowing cost as a part of the property plant equipment cost. Now question comes, I have not borrowed. There are two questions. One thing I have borrowed, fund could not be utilized. I have kept the amount in the bank. I have got the interest. Whether the interest earned on the borrowing cost or interest earned on the fixed deposit, I have borrowed 100 crores from the bank for my property plant equipment. It could not be utilized. Suppose purchase or placement may delay. Ho gaya. I could not utilize the fund. That 100 crores, whatever I have taken in the form of loan, I have kept as a fixed deposit. And that fixed deposit has given some interest to me. Whether that interest I will use for the purpose of this uh, uh, borrowing cost reduction in the property plant equipment or I will take to the 
profitable as account as a part of income. Definitely, it is to be adjusted with the borrowing cost because the property, plant, and equipment contains a major element of the interest component attributable to the borrowed fund made by you. So any income you are earning due to non-utilization of this fund, borrowed fund, is to be adjusted with the interest or the borrowing cost what you have charged to the property and plant equipment. Another question comes, we are paying that uh, mobilization advance. In case of project contracts, either from borrowed fund you can pay the mobilization advance or you can pay from your own equity or the, your accrued or uh, this uh, whatever the cash reserve you have, from that you can pay. If it is a borrowed fund, as I explained earlier, whatever interest I am earning against the mobilization advance, definitely that will be adjusted against the borrowing cost. If I am having any fund out of the equity or out of the accrued cash reserve from the operation area, no borrowed fund, then it should not be adjusted with the borrowing cost or the property plant and equipment because this is out of the accrued cash reserve. Had it been utilized other ways, if I have kept that amount as a fixed deposit in the bank, then I would have earned the income to be taken as a part of profit and loss account, not as a part of the borrowing cost. As I am having the sufficient fund, I have not opted for borrowing my borrowed money, and out of that my cash reserve, instead of keeping the amount to the bank, I have facilitated in providing mobilization advance to the vendor. So whatever interest I am earning from the mobilization advance payment to the vendors, out of my cash reserve, that will be that should be taken as a part of your property and loss account and not to be adjusted with this uh, property plant and equipment. Continue technical assistant. Normally, the technology, whenever we are having a new plant, we are taking a technology, a technology provider or a technology collaborator, definitely it will be forming part of your property plant and equipment, particularly the basic engineering and drawing. Again, consultancy for DPR, detail engineering, construction management whether it will form part of this property, plant, and equipment. If I am giving a consultancy, there are two things we can bifurcate the decision. That means one is post-investment decision, one is pre-investment decision. The company, the management of the company requires the expert advice whether to go for this project or not. That DPR, that consultancy cost for preparation of DPR to take an investment decision will not form part of the project cost because as of that date you are not sure whether the project will come or not so you cannot say that that consultancy whatever it, uh, dpr has prepared and has given various alternatives and uh, management selected one of that so that is not directly attainable but after the investment decision if you are appointing a consultant for its detail engineering construction management etc those things are directly attributable to bring the project into its location and condition so post investment investment decision any consultancy you are doing any cost to that effect should form part of your project cost. Enabling was that should form part of the project cost. Now the question is CSR. What is corporate social responsibility or um, uh, this uh, environment social commitment? Now these new concepts are coming. These are not directly related to project, but there are certain obligations the company has to meet as per the statutory or the uh, government uh, mandates. In case of CSR, what happens? It is not exactly the CSR as per the section 135 of the Companies Act. Rather, it is the nature of CSR, but mandated by the authority with whom you want to make a deal either to purchase of land or mining of lease or some uh, facilitation uh, to go ahead with your project. Suppose I am going to install a plant of uh, 5,000 crores and uh, in the government of Odisha, in the state of Odisha. And when applying for the land for the government of Odisha, government of Odisha told me that, okay, you are having this uh, 10,000 crores of project. You spend 500 crores uh, for bringing a hospital in that location because there is no hospital in that area. So for the uh, people of that area, for the CSR, all, whatever reason you may call, you bring a uh, hospital of 500 crores for the benefit of the society. Not directly benefit will be accrued to the plant or the business. Since it is one-to-one, that means unless I am paying or spending that item, even though it is CSR, my project will not come. So that type of conditional CSR expenses, not beyond the provision of section 135, qualifies to form part of the property planted equipment. Similarly, there are some environment social um, commitment. If you are giving this, um, uh, that uh, as to today, nowadays the um, forest department or the environment department, they are telling that 0.5% of your project cost 
you must be spending in the social commitment activities which is nothing but csr there is no one to one tangible assets you are like look at but unless you spend that money or as clearance will not be available to you so such type of expenditure are directly attributable and even though in the nature of csr should form part of your property plant and equipment payment of npv you know uh, if you have some um, uh, participants in the mining industry so npv we are paying for this uh, acquisition of mines appreciation the stamp duty all these forms part of your property plant and equipment then uh, insurance road tax normally any vehicle we are procuring the first time insurance and the road tax must be should be capitalized then expenses to obtain permission of forest clearance and management class already have told another thing just i was if somebody is in the power sector they can think uh, the if they are having the idea of as per normally the power sectors they are consuming huge quantum of coal and when they were consuming coal lot of ash is generated and to for disposal of that ash there are various ash ponds they used to maintain now the concept of suppose the ash pond one ash pond is filled up then for continuity of plant you are going to a construction of next next ash pond now the one idea has come that instead of creating a new ash pond whether i create a ash mound or the mountain type of thing whether this can that can qualify as a revenue expenditure or to as a capital expenditure as because ash pond has a limited life suppose that limited life has been exhausted with complete filling of fly ash or the sorry this dry ash removed from the power plant this ash mound means you are creating a structure out of the air or out of the heaven so to say that means beyond your this embankment level or the bank of the this height of the dam above that you are raising the mound mound is a structure mountain type of thing you are creating in the middle of the asphalt to put the push that ash into the air that means a structure is created and that much vacant space is created in the feasible asphalt as because it gives a additional capacity to you which has giving a future economic benefit you can consider this ash mound or this structure which um, uh, gives additional space in your ash mound for future restoration of ash or disposal of ash can qualify as a property plant and equipment now question comes rehabilitation compensation yes rehabilitation compensation whenever you are going for a new project it requires a rehabilitation compensation as per the arandar policy of the government of india or government of odisha so whatever rehabilitation compensation we are paying definitely it should form part of the property plant and equipment then income from scrap disposal project surplus i am doing a project there are a lot of scraps are generated those scraps whatever i am getting whether that should be reduced from the project cost or the capitalization cost or i should be taken directly as a income from the the um, revenue income from the uh, property owner's account so any scrap disposal out of the project definitely should be reduced from the project cost because whatever income you are getting from the project it should be reduced from the project value similarly income from trial operation because when the project is completed if you are operating some guarantee period is there is there trial operation before it's put into commercial operation out of the during the trial operation you have got some production and out of that production you have got some income so whatever the income you have got income is total revenue minus expenditure you have made in the trial operation so whatever profit or the income you have earned out of the trial operation should be reduced from the cost of the property plant and equipment allocation of common expenses overheads normally there are um, depending on the nature of contract or depending on the nature of project if there are common expenses these are to be allocated to various overheads so the companies they have to decide their own policy about the allocation methodology of these overheads another aspect is the asset laid on net not belonging to the company this is an important aspect certain uh, railway lines bridges normally these are constructed by the companies with a permission only those lands are not acquired or owned or controlled by the company but for the purpose of business i have to construct it the i may, may not challenge the authority of that land or the ownership of the land but i am owning making that asset for my business to have its operation as desired by the management so even though i am not the owner of the land those assets are to be construed as a part of property plant and equipment now no question comes it is a cluster project suppose two three vendors they join hands together a common project they are doing in a separate place neither the land is owned 
nor a common feasible asset is owned by you. A, B, C, three vendors, there are three companies joined together. They started to put a plant or a facility to get, suppose let us take the case of power, power uh, supply. Now the companies, they joined hands, they make a transmission line, put it in a common platform, hand over it to OPTCL for uh, transmission of power, and equally distribute the cost among themselves. So how you will deal this item? This as a in your books of accounts. Because the entire cost of the uh, entire value or the entire uh, facility is not owned by you. You are only authorized to get the benefit of one third. And accordingly, the cost also you have shared in the as one third. So this cluster project also to be taken as a part of user right. Because you are no, having no right for property, plant, and equipment. Only this is a common asset to be benefit to be enjoyed by the co-beneficiaries. So as a benefit, only you can consider these items as a part of fixed asset in the name of user right, not as exactly identified property, plant, and equipment. If I put a transmission transformer there, that transformer is not my asset. My interest is a transformer is the user right to me. Next, monuments, beautification items. Normally in the plants, all the things, there are a lot of monuments, beautification, expenditure are doing. Normally, it should not be construed as a capital item because this is for beautification. It, hardly there is any future economic benefit out of it, other than the pleasure of the uh, residents, those who are sitting, or those who are residing in the uh, township or any office, anything. So monuments, beautification, normally it should not be considered as a part of capital expenditure or as a part of property planted equipment. Liability recognition for capital expenditure will cover it separately. Then asset held for disposal, already we have discussed. So these are some of the items just I want to share with you because these are industry specific. Those who are coming across with this, they can visualize what is the difficulty to take a call. I think it will help them in identification and uh, how to address it. Now, next we'll go to the componentization. Why this componentization came? This is not a part of your index system. Rather, it is a part of Schedule 2 to the Companies Act 2013. Why this confrontation came? The basic essence of confrontation is that I am having a major plant, but major plant uh, contains certain critical components which are to be replaced early as compared to the mother equipment. Suppose mother equipment, I have purchased a cost with a cost, cost of 100 crore, and it contains three major parts which have to be replaced at a period interval of 10 years. That means within the life of the mother plant, three times I have to replace the confrontation. If in the earlier prior to confrontation, what, what we would have, we have only one mother asset of 100 crore, any replacement I'm doing, charging to revenue. But it's benefit I'm getting over next 10 years. So this confrontation, whatever it has been uh, introduced in the Schedule 2 to the Companies Act, what it specifies where a cost of part of the asset is significant to total cost and the useful life of that. These are two important aspects. First of all, the life of the part or the component must be different from the that of useful life of the remaining asset. Second thing, normally the cost should be significant. Otherwise, why I will do this much of exercise? So cost must be significant. And most important is that life is different than the useful life of the remaining asset. Then you can take this as a componentization. Componentization means it is a differently capitalized from the mother equipment. So that when the componentization calls for replacement, without disturbing the mother plant, you can go for replacement right after the old one and capitalize the new one. That means replacement has become easier with a adequate financial control. Now let us come to second aspect of it, depreciation. As we normally know, Depreciation, why you are charging? This is due to wear and tear, and uh, of course, the flux of time. There is a reduction in the value of the asset, so we must have to charge depreciation. That is the normal meaning what you understand by depreciation. Earlier, the Companies Act 1956, it has given a lie that a percentage based depreciation. At that time, there was continuous process plan and various depreciation rates for different items. Now, in the this India's uh, sorry the Companies Act uh, Schedule Two, it has given a life based depreciation. That means now it is no more a percentage. It is a life base. So that life they have determined for various 
plant and machinery, furniture, fixture, various nature of tangible, intangible assets. They have given their life accordingly. The depreciation of that uh, asset is to be depreciated or to be amortized over the useful life. So normally it is available in the schedule two. The company can have a decision, but cannot increase the uh, rate uh, of the life of the depreciation as provided. It can reduce it, but should not increase. Then the second question is that the residual value and the useful life. Normally what happens? Whenever it is a depreciable life, normal, whether 100% life is to be depreciated or certain value is to be maintained as a residual life, beyond which I will not charge depreciation. So that is a, there is a management judgment. There is no mandate whether you will go for 100% uh, depreciation or you will go for 95% depreciation and 5% to keep. If the management feels that these asset will carry some residual value and on disposal, I will get this residual value, I will realize it, then there is no harm to maintain it, but it should not exceed 5%. So now the question comes, when you should start depreciation? As I have already told earlier, you will continue to bring the asset value or accumulate the asset value till the time it is ready for put to use or till the time it is readily available as intended by the management. So that means once the work is ready for put to use, all your expenditure is over and the engineer in charge or the project in charge confirms that the asset is ready or put to use. Please try to differentiate. Ready for put to use and put to use. These are two different things. Put to use means if I'm using this, suppose I've got a machinery. If that machinery is used, then it is put to use. If it is ready for put to use, that means the asset commissioning part is over. I, I may not put to use. There is no marketing requirement. So I am not putting into use. But if it is ready for put to use, then depreciation should start and you should capitalize it. So you must have to differentiate between asset ready for put to use and put to use. So normally the depreciation of an asset begins when it is available for use, when it is in the location and condition necessary for it to be capable of operating in the manner intended by management. And when the depreciation will cease, take a depreciation on a start cardia when it is available for use, irrespective of the date of use. Then when the depreciation should cease, when should I stop? The depreciation of an asset shall cease at the earlier date that the asset is classified as held for sale. That means when you are feeling that the asset is not of any use to you, having no future economic benefit, and is it likely to be retired from active use, then you should stop the depreciation. Because at that point of time, you are taking a decision, now this, this asset is held for sale, or for disposal, or for write-off. That means when I'm taking a call that this asset is held for sale, then my depreciation should cease. Depreciation method, already we know, straight line method, reducing, um, uh, this reducing balance method, whatever you can do, but normally the depreciation method should be used with the pattern how the company's future economic benefit is assessed. Suppose there are in the mining industry, the permission is also granted. Either you can get a uh, production unit measurement basis instead of life, that is also allowed. So that depends on the pattern in which the asset's future economic benefit is expected. It is not necessarily the life. Suppose I'm having a mining, mining, uh, mining uh, mines, and a lot of assets there in the mines, and uh, there is a reserve for next uh, 30, 40 years. But the company chart is telling that uh, this, uh, whatever assets are there are likely to come or is there, they're having a life of say 20 years, but my reserve is there for 30 years. Now, what should I do? Whether I'll refer to the company chart or whether they'll go for this, this um, uh, mines reserve. So definitely these assets, whatever it will be given, even though it will not exceed whatever the rate prescribed in the company chart. So whatever, if I'm having proper justification to it, within the ambit of the company chart, then I have to revisit whether I will go to the um, production unit method, method basis or I will go for this company chart basis. Then I will take a call because I cannot overrule the condition stipulated or the life stipulated in the company chart. Even the reserve is there, I cannot extend my depreciation till the reserve is made available. But if company chart allows for a higher period, then I have to limit up to the reserve available to me in the mines. 
So normally the accounting standard prescribes the depreciation method to be reviewed, at least each financial year end. Then change should be accounted. Whatever the changes, if there is any change, either due to error, omission, anything or policy, that should be accounted for as a change in the accounting estimate in accounting in, in compliance with the accounting standard in the state. And uh, the unit, method that is also mentioned, the straight line method also, diminishing balance, unit of production. That depends, the, the management has to take a call that what methodology should I adopt, but whatever you are deciding, consistently you have to follow. Not that this year taking one method and the next year you are switching to other, other method. Change of the method from one method to other is not allowed. Already we have discussed uh, life, this, uh, all the things we have discussed, so not to stay. Now this question comes. There are different useful life. If you will see the companies act having the same class, there are different life also. Like in the building, if RCC, it has a separate life. If it is non-RCC, it has a separate life. If we will go to the very essence of uh, this index over the earlier, say, earlier account standard, the basic essence is that you have to go into the deep, into the business instead of the principle. What is the underlying fact? The RCC is, uh, gives a better life, strong asset, strong foundation, which leave, gives me a better life of the asset. Non-RCC gives me a less life asset. Accordingly, the companies are house even the same building. I mean, building classification is same, but for RCC, it is a different life. Non-RCC is a different life. Similarly, roads, carpet, carpet road, non-carpet road, RCC, non-RCC, that's even different. So my purpose of telling is that the India, this uh, Schedule 2 has gone into deep with more analysis. They have given a clear, useful, best life in the industry for all these assets, those are likely to come. That may be plant and machinery, that may be in the furniture fitting. If it is in the general, some life, if it's in the hotels, it is uh, more used, so life is uh, less. Similarly, these motor vehicles, two-wheelers, four-wheelers, computers, servers, networking. So all these things, even the class is same, it should not be constructed that class is same, rate will be same. In the same class also, the rate will be different depending on the nature of use or the nature of industry. Now, one question comes, how will compute the depreciation when there is any addition or disposal? Suppose the addition, there is no issue because if the life is more than one year, part of the year, you are computing depending on the number of days available in the current finance year. But when it is sold or disposed in between a finance year, then how will compute the depreciation? So it should be computed proportionately for that finance year, whatever residual value is there, or the residual depreciable life is there, that will be proportionately calculated and depreciation to be charged in that finance year. Particularly coming to the assets, certain issues that you may be facing in the industry, particularly depreciation on the mining asset that we have discussed. That means I am having the mining reserve up to this, but companies are tails up to this. So what should be my depreciation, depreciable life? So already we have discussed, accordingly, you may take a call. Then access, access not put to use, already we have discussed. So if the asset is ready for put to use, even not to put to use, you have to charge depreciation. Then depreciation versus premature write-off of asset. Normally, something sometimes it happens. Suppose the depreciable life is 15 years. After 10 years, my engineering department told me that this asset is no more useful to me. That means there is a net book value available or net depreciable value available to me on the date of declaration that this asset is no more of active use. There, question comes, the balance value jo hai, should I go by depreciation or should I go by write-off? It should be go, treated as a written write-off of the asset of the value, not as a depreciation. Because for the rest of the period, I am not using that. So value which has not been existed. Due to prima, due to some reason, they, this has become premature failure, or um, that um, it has just it has not existed. It's original NBC's life. So any premature failure of the plant and machinery or any of the asset should be treated as write up of the asset to be charged to profit and loss instead of depreciation. Special asset, asthma, red bond, already we have told that these type of points 
नॉर्मली उसका डिप्रेशन डिपेंड करता है व्हाट इज द होल्डिंग कैपेसिटी सो ऑन द ईयर एंड इन डे यू हैव टू इवेल्युएट व्हाट इज द एडिशनल होल्डिंग कैपेसिटी अवेलेबल इन द पॉन्ड सो दैट अकॉर्डिंगली यू कैन वर्क आउट द डिप्रेशन मेजर स्क्वायर मेजर ओवरऑल ऑलरेडी वी हैव डिस्कस्ड डिप्रेशन वन थिंग ओनली आई विल टेल द मेजर स्क्वायर और मेजर ओवरऑल मेजर स्क्वायर यू कैन यू विल कंसीडर एज अ पार्ट ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी प्लांट एंड इक्विपमेंट बट व्हेन एवर देयर इज अ रिप्लेसमेंट ऑफ द मेजर स्क्वायर immediate de recognition is required in the original spare fitted to the equipment because one machine cannot be fitted with two spares so earlier prior to this um, this uh, india system all these spares were treated as inventory of store spares after this introduction of this india system having a future life useful life of more than one year i have put these items as a major spare but whenever these major spares are issued for consumption please ensure that the original spare fitted to the equipment are to be written off now the question comes how to get the value when the major spare came because company india system came in the year 2016 my plant is there commissioned in the 2005 or 6 i don't have the details of the major spare so that is not the excuse that the major spare you will not write off you have to give a proof that that item is taken out if either you can take it as a replacement cost or you can take a uh, this um, um, that uh, discounted method or worst of all you can take a 1 rupee also but in the books of accounts you have to declare that the original spare related to the equipment is written off then depreciation value adjustment we know that residential furnitures it is not that much clear now the question is that when will de recognize already have discussed that means we will de, de recognize the property de recognize means recognition when you will capitalize it de recognition when you will decapitalize or write off it so the carrying amount of item of property should be de recognized on disposal on no and no when no future income benefits are expected from its use and the gain or loss arising from de recognition here de recognition means we can use our commercial term as right of in our industrial language we call the right of of the plant and machinery when it is beyond the economic repair or when it is not giving the active use in my operation there are certain disclosure requirements in the uh, mandated by this accounting standard the measurement base you have to decide and declare the depreciation method you have to decide and declare the useful life you have to declare gross carrying amount in the form of reconciliation you have to give it whatever additions you are having <coughs> also assets classified as held for sale that means you have written off but you have classified as held for sale then also you have to declare it impairment losses if you have recognized if any in the property loss that you have to declare and against the impairment also if you have got it back suppose In the in, um, year last year, I have provided certain impairment loss. Depending on the then because in case of impairment, I am comparing two values. What is the carrying amount of the asset? What is the recoverable amount of the asset? The recoverable amount it is um, covering one thing, one part from the realization from the sale proceed of whatever you are getting the product sale. And second thing in the worst case, if you are selling the property or the plant and equipment, what is the value you are going to get? So if the situation improves and I am getting a better profit out of the sale proceeds of my product. then this impairment loss what i provided last year that is revisit and it may so require that again i have to calculate my impairment loss and i may have to reverse the earlier provision whatever you have created that part you have to also disclose and also depreciation all the things this has to be disclosed now this caro 2020 this has been mandatory for this financial year 2021 22 all the participants may have to take a note of this that uh, this uh, uh, mandatory these are things are already earlier there but some new things has been introduced this uh, hello any yes sir any issue okay should i continue yes sir yes sir okay so the compliance to paro But the, the the requirement is that there must be physical verification of all tangible or intangible or tangible assets or intangible asset you are having. So all the records maintained by the company it must display the complete particulars. आपका asset register में पूरा रहना है 
what are the details of the asset what is its quantity where it is located and irrespective of the tangible intangible all the assets details must be available in the asset register maintained by the company then the management must have to carry a physical verification of the asset at different intervals preferably the movable fixed assets must be may be covered every year and the immovable fixed asset depend with an interval of 3 to 4 years or 5 years depending on the size of the business so or the size of the company that the management can take a call if there is any material this is third one is most important if there is a material discrepancy if it is not a suppose physical verifier has reported a material discrepancy then you must have to account for in the books of accounts another aspect is that now this is introduced to this caro that the title is pertaining to the immovable properties particularly to the land the title is pertaining to immovable property which are leased by the company with a duly executed lease agreement disclosing the final statement are held in the name of the company that means title deed must be available in the name of the company if there is no title deed to that extent disclosure also made to be made in the financial statement there are certain thing and one important thing now they are asking in the disclosure the age wise analysis of capital work in progress if you are having a capital there suppose in either it may be a self construction asset or the capital asset or the project it is only delayed then now you have to provide in the financial statement that what are the this um, life of the asset more than uh, less than one year one year to two year two to three years and more than three, three years and if something is abandoned also you have to give a clear definite meaning to it that why there is a delay why there is because now earlier this uh, disclosure was not required um in the this um, ro report by the given by the auditors now the auditors they have to disclose that yes this cwip if it is lying for more than 3 years so kitna jitna cwip khata mein dikha hai isme itna less than 1 year less than 2 year less than 3 years or jo more than 3 years definitely you have to give a reason why it is pending for more than 3 years indefinitely you are not allowed to continue such assets are cwip more than 3 years which is risky on the auditors report point of view impairment already you have covered so i am not covering impairment now certain things say two three issues only before coming to the inventory just i'll be give a small idea about certain issues how to deal it directly attributable cost mein ek item hota hai just i am giving now examples suppose jaise ki maine bataya the company has to incur significant cost for obtaining permission for environmental clearance whether should it should form part of the project cost yes it should form part of the project cost then asset led on land not belonging to company we are having railway siding road bridges etc led on the land not owned by the company but you have got the permission otherwise nobody will allow you to construct your assets now question is that whether i can capitalize the expenditure as a property plan recruitment then how to capitalize because those assets whether it will be in the name of that tangible assets whatever in the name it is available or in which form it is to be given because i have spent huge amount for construction of those assets but those assets are led on the land not owned by me me tomorrow if something happens to that land title deed or land ownership then it may not hold good for me so whether i will capitalize those items as a tangible identified items in my books of accounts so first question is that yes those are eligible item to be considered as a part of plant and as a property plant recruitment now question is that If it's a railway siding, road bridge, etc., should I consider as a railway siding, road bridge as a identified asset in my books? No. It should be a common cost for the project to be allocated over the identified assets. Those are likely to come in the project. Major spare already we have discussed. Major overhauling along with major spare. Suppose there are in certain plants there are some mandatory guideline that with a frequent interval. you have to make some overhauling like particular the power generating industries these um, tgs boilers all the things are to be um, um, reviewed or to be uh, examined or to be inspected with a gap of 3 to 4 years after the running of this much of hours if required that is to be overhauled and to be made ready or next operational so such overhauling sees as a future future economic benefit and the value is substantial also so this major overhauling can form part of pp 
and again question comes what you will do with the major overhauling available in the asset in the original commissioning so you have to identify the original commissioning this major overall commissioning cost as a part of this because what in the major overall you are doing you are taking out the original boiler or the tg you are making complete dismantling again you are putting with correction to the same boiler with rectification if any required then it is becoming operational so since major overhauling again two times major overhauling cost i cannot add into my asset so first major overhauling original overhauling cost i can identify i can replace it or i can write up it and new major overhauling cost i can consider as my pp employee cost already we have identified relocation rehabilitation already I, we have discussed liquidated damage we have discussed componentization also we have discussed rehabilitation discussed restoration obligation yes we have discussed now particularly for this subject i will request the participants any questions particularly on property plant and equipment if there is any question you can ask or we can switch over to the inventory and we can thereafter we will discuss choice is yours now if any question related to property plant and equipment you can put the question that is nice Sir, we may take the question at the end, sir. Okay, fine. We may request the participant to put your question in chat box. Finally, after uh, concluding our session, uh, we one by one will take the question. Sir, please. Fine. What I'll request, I think in the chat box there are thirty-four uh, messages are there from the institute. If you can note down. Uh, then, uh, if you can read one by one, after this, uh, this uh, deliberation is over, inventory is over. In this, two will cover. After that, all these chat box में जो भी items हैं, if you can note some of the things, then we can yes, also sir, deliberate yes. that. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Now let us come to second uh, part of our uh, deliberation today's deliberation. That is inventory. From the industry perspective, I am not telling. From the audit perspective, only I am telling. This inventory is a sensitive area, which draws attention of all the auditors, because you can increase, decrease, manipulate. You can do lot of things with the inventory in the form of its valuation. So always, it may be the statutory auditors, it may be the CAG auditors, it may be the internal auditors. whatever profitability your profitability is directly affected by the inventory valuation so this index to it was much so far as the valuation of the inventory is concerned so some of the important tips that we will discuss here so what is the inventory in common definition the inventories these are assets again these are assets again assets definition already i have told in the pp not to repeat So inventories are assets. Those are held for sale in the ordinary course of business, in the process of production for such sale, or in the form of material supply. So three underlining part, please see. First thing, these assets are held for sale in the ordinary course of business. This is just different. What we have discussed. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Inven. So. as thing i am telling these are the assets held for sale in the ordinary course of business the second part of is that in the first thing that means if i am having any of the finished good available with me for sale that is forming part of inventory second thing if there is some something in the process of production for such sale to enable such production if i am something in the process that is also forming part of the inventory and third item in the form of material or supplies to be consumed in the production process so if there is any material or supplies available to be consumed then also this request to be identified as inventory so to sum up under three category normally we are reporting in the financial statement one thing is the finished goods second thing is the finished goods that means ready for sale so this is finished goods second thing in process and you can include that semi finished everything for which it is not process finishing is not completed or the process is not completed so we can call it in process stock And the third item is raw material stores, spares, and consumables. So, in general, in the industrial scenario, we are identifying these three types of inventories in our business operation. What is the impact of the finance statement? So, already I have told, sir, any undervaluation or the overvaluation of the inventory 
who will distort your financial statement either in the profit and statement or in the balance sheet and it will affect for the more than one accounting period what is the meaning of for the more than one to one accounting period suppose this year i have made what is this inventory this is an item of production could not be sold or could not be converted to revenue that's why as a recognition criteria i am evaluating that stock and as a matching concept putting as a value and giving its recognition in my financial statement suppose this year due to some reason my inventory has been undervalued suppose company's profit is high and to suppress the profit they have made the undervaluation then what will happen this year this mistake is carried forward to next year to another mistake because this undervaluation or this profit of this year is carried forward to the next year because same inventory will be displaced next year in the form of sale against which you will get the realization so your undervaluation of inventory me, in the next sir. year will not sir is there any slide the slide is not moving sir Is am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now audible. But uh, the screen is not coming. Okay. Nice. Let, me, let me complete and then again I will come. So now thing is that uh, this uh, inventory we are discussing. Okay. So first the measurement part. what is the problem with us problem is that inventory we know that it should be lower of cost and net realized value so far as the cost is there for raw material it is the weighted average price or the moving average price whatever the methodology the management is adopted that cost price is available suppose three elements we are having as we have told there is a finished good there is a infrastructure and there is a raw material if we come from downward raw material store space and consumables these are being purchased items and controlled as a part of natural inventory as it is purchased so its value is available on a historical cost basis whatever the cost of procurement and net of task credit whatever it is there so there is no nrb required unless there is a compulsion of reduction in the nrb for its expected use the very purpose of telling is that normally we don't reduce the value of raw material stores spares and consumables if the sell price of the product in which this item of spare is consumed is more if there is a downward movement of the sell price of this product where such spare is used then i may have to re revisit the nrb otherwise for stores spares and consumable if the market price of the finished product for which you are having sell price is there if that price remains the same or it is more then i may not have to requirement to revisit the nrb for this raw material store spare consumable rather is the purchase cost whatever it is maintained in my books of accounts that will be disclosed all be reported as the valuation of inventory second thing the cost of inventory comprises or all cost of purchase cost of conversion now the question comes in process and finished good the basic question comes the valuation of inventory of finished goods and in process 
that varies from process to pro industry to industry there may be a process industry there is may job because if process costing is followed the one uh, method of the um, product passes from one process to other with every addition of value in the form of cost if it is a job cost or job costing is assigned so it is a job card or the job cost for a particular job you are accumulating and it is identified so this is depending on the nature of industry and the practice of in the, uh, you are following for the post of uh, purpose of your inventory valuation or preparation of the cost sheet now the question comes is the cost of inventory whatever cost of purchase it is a must in addition to that it requires to include conversion and other cost again the same philosophy the incurred in bringing the inventory to their present location and condition i have got the raw material procured i have got all the stores fair procured but raw material stores fair itself will be not be converted to a finished good it requires certain other expenditure other certain other effort to convert these item into finished good so whatever conversion cost that will form part of your this uh, um, cost of inventory now in this uh, to specify that certain items of administrative expenditure whether it will form part of your cost of production or not in this to allows allocation of certain specific items of cost administrative cost to form part of your property plant and equipment uh, sorry or cost of part of your cost of production we will come to that in the next slide i think it is there then the second para may please see the cost of conversion of inventory includes cost directly related to the units of production such as direct labor they also include systematic allocation of fixed and variable production overheads that are incurred in converting materials into finished goods let us give take the example apart from per purchase of raw material purchase of power and fuel normally in our industrial language we are calling this raw material and power and fuel we are calling the bill of material that means for each ton of finished good this much of standard requirement i do have for the inputs so that is one to one correlation so for this much of production i require this much of raw material those are clearly identifiable item that is one to one identified but coming to salary administration consumables those cannot be identified one to one then how to incorporate these values particularly the salary and the administrative expenses how to allocate this value to your production cost now the question is that there is a uh, debate on normal capacity and the uh, actual capacity this is the denominator normally what happens suppose my installed capacity of the plant is 10000 ton all my employee deployment employee deployment all my administrative expenditure all are with envisaging 10000 tons of production so the standard environment tells me that per unit cost whatever expenditure you are doing that should be this 10000 but this year my production is 6000 if it is 6000 then whether some total cost for the purpose of cost of conversion should be divided by 6000 or it will be 10000 so you will refer the earlier as to and also the essence of indes to they are telling that there is no be a systematic allocation of the fixed and variable production overheads so normally we have to see that normal capacity is taken into consideration now question comes what is normal capacity there is installed capacity we know that is for the techno engineering of the plant there is actual capacity that is actual utilization of the plant then what is the normal capacity so as it has been clarified in some of the documents and some of the suggestions and the guidelines also so normal capacity means 3 years average so last year whatever the accomplishment actual achievement or the actual capacity you have achieved this year whatever you have achieved and next year what is the target this should be considered as your average of this will be considered as the normal capacity and the administrative overhead is to be divided by this normal capacity to decide a administrative cost per unit to be loaded as a part of the conversion cost into the cost of production ne nrb already we have discussed that the um, nrb it is this uh, whatever we will be getting in the ordinary course of business from the markets 
if the nrb is less then we may have to think about the written down of the value of inventory on the year ending day raw material stores fares and consumables i have told in process stock whatever i am charging also i have taken that into account because that is a process development to the extent process is completed accordingly the factors you have to take into consider for the purpose of inventory valuation suppose my production process is completed material 100% completed and conversion is 50% completed then i have to take for the purpose of in process stock valuation material 100% and conversion cost 50% so that conversion depends upon the completion of the process at which you are making the inventory valuation for in process stock and for the finish good it is the cost price or the nrb normally cost price is always less because we are um, putting a price uh, profit element in that to have the sales price and normally it is the market price but uh, in some, in some abnormal situation depending the market situation the nrb also gets reduced or the market sales realization in the ordinary course of business is less than the cost then you have to revisit your nrb as well as the cost at that time you cannot follow the cost rather the nrb you have to consider for the purpose of your valuation some of the issues related to inventory just i will share because the, the industry experience whatever we have uh, debating certain times how to account for it store spares as a part of pp yes already we have discussed if it is a part of major spare because any spare if it is more than one year definitely it is qualifying pp but uh, taking a materiality concept you can make a limitation like uh, be more than uh, 5 lakh rupees or more than 10, uh, 1 lakh rupees depending on the size of the business depending on the size of industry you can keep a materiality concept or a benchmark that below this this will be inventory above this this will be property plant and equipment but please ensure that whenever you are replacing a major spare in the original equipment because all these store spares are replacement of the parts fitted in the mother equipment so whenever you are going for replacement please don't forget to de recognize the original spare fitted to the equipment then normal loss or abnormal loss in the inventory valuation what you will do in case of, what is why this question of normal or abnormal loss whenever you are getting some bulk of material like coal or some um, bauxite or any input we are getting from the different areas then we have to identify that what is that normal loss and abnormal loss normal loss in the ordinary course of business or the ordinary process of plant operation this loss is likely to happen you cannot stop it because suppose that um, i am processing in this in our plant i suppose bauxite we are processing maybe 0.005 it is um, getting lost in the process of transportation from a to y so that is a normal loss and mandatory it is mandatory to happen i cannot avoid it so this is normal loss abnormal loss which is uh, occurring abnormally which accident ho gaya which fire ho gaya if these are abnormal loss this should not form part of inventory and should not also form part of your consumption cost because normal loss as a part of your consumption or a part of your normal consumption expenditure is taken abnormal loss is charged to the administrative expenses that is the basic difference the normal loss as a part of inventory valuation or as a part of the this uh, um, uh, process requirement you are charging to consumption but abnormal loss it is beyond the process requirement being abnormal in nature taken as a administrative cost in your profit and loss account and also not forming part of your inventory valuation then coming to normal capacity already we have discussed another concept is that non moving or slow moving inventory it is the industry practice now suppose i am putting an with every like in the property plant and equipment due to efflux of time there is a depreciation and there is a reduction in the value then why the same concept is not applicable to inventory yes that holds also good because in case of inventory if i am consuming the material for one or two year but i am not consuming for more than five years it has also its life definitely in some intrinsic value is getting reduced so company has to revisit its policy if the item is lying for more than is any period 3 years 4 years every company must having a policy of identification or analyzing slow moving non moving and having a adequate policy to address that yes whatever inventory i am having it will future that much of value in future that's why adequate reduction reduction of the value for the non moving items must be taken care by the industries then inventory generated during project stage or trial operation 
any inventory we are getting generated during project stage. What should be its methodology of valuation? Definitely it is inventory. That inventory can be sold as is or can be used to the mother plant or the original plant for its use. But what are the methodology? Because there cannot be a transfer pricing element. Here only inventory, because in the process of project, I have generated that product. That a commercial operation has not been started. So whatever inventory I'm generating, that valuation should be based on the minimum possible because no extra element to be loaded on that so that your project cost will be reduced. So raw material cost definitely it will be there because the raw material is converted to finished goods. All other elements of administrative expenditure preferably should not be considered. Then inclusion of GST in the valuation of inventory. If in your plant, some of the non-eligible input tax credit items are there. Suppose there is a common inventory. The inventory holds certain goods to be used in the non-plant activities like township or some human consumption for which the tax credit is not allowed. In those cases, you must ensure during valuation of inventory that GST component is included there. Then inventory valuation and account in SAPRP, perhaps this will be a long, longer time. I cannot uh, share that at this point of time because some more deliberation is required. We'll take up in a later stage if possible. Then accounting of discrepancy and physical verification. Now question comes, CARO mandates that there must be a physical verification at every at a periodical interval, maybe year ending, maybe three years ending, whatever it is. Inventory verification every year end. And if it's a listed company, it is preferable to have a physical verification of the in major raw material on a quarterly basis. But the perpetual inventory verification of the store, spare, consumable must be covered once in a year. And whatever the discrepancy we are finding at the year end, now there is a caro, I think it is a relaxation. Earlier, what you used to do, if the discrepancy is noticed, irrespective of the value, we are recognizing in the accounts keeping as a suspense because normally why this uh, discrepancy occurs due to misplacement, due to change in location, due to mishandling so that we are allowing the user department or the custodian of the store to allow him. Hey, thik, aapko Excel de diya. Excel ke andar mein aap sort out karo, ye metal kahan pada hai, so that discrepancy can be sorted out. It is not that the all discrepancy will result into a consumption or expenditure. It means the discrepancy may be due to wrong location or misplacement of the items. But on a conservative basis, whatever the discrepancy is noted, that we are charging to the property and loss account and having a suspense or a, so to say, control account without having reducing the natural inventory in the inventory accounting system. For the raw material, but in this uh, caro, now they are given a liberty of 10%. That means if the value of discrepancy is more than 10% of the inventory you are holding, then you can recognize that discrepancy in your books of accounts. Coming to this uh, um, um, bulk material like coal, identified location, you have to take a call. What is the volume of discrepancy? What is it's the total uh, inventory available? Then accordingly, based on the CARO, uh, this uh, guidelines, you can take a call how to address. Normally, if there is a physical verification, there is a shortage, it is to be written off and it is excess, then the stock is to be created because in SAP, unless you create or create that much of stock, that cannot be issued for consumption in the next process. So either it may be excess or it is shortage. You have to account for in this SAP account, metal account, if you are having SAP, then metal account system, even if not in SAP, if it is 10, more than 10%, the discrepancy, the value of discrepancy reported by the physical verifier is more than 10% of the inventory hold, then you must have to recognize. Another issue is that internally generated scrap valuation and its recognition. Normally, the manufacturing industries, they're having huge, a lot of scraps. It is not the uh, process scrap. It is the generated scrap starting from gunny bag, packing, old, uh, huge spares, oils, all these things. It has some value. But now the question comes, but whether this should be recognized as a part of inventory or it is should be so disclosed only when it is sold and you are getting a cash. As because in our accounting practice, we are not following the accrual system of accounting. In my view, it should be reported as inventory. So at the year end, 
these crops available with the company not being disposed of having certain value by either uh, with a standard uh, practice or procedure we have to recognize that inventory at the year end date to be sold in the success next financial year otherwise if i will wait no when i will sell i will recognize the inventory this may lead to a cash basis accounting because in this year end i have not recognized only i am recognized when i am making the sales and getting the realization so it is better to recognize the inventory as available on the year ending date to the with the most reasonable price in compliance to the provisions of the standard project scarves already have discussed disclosures yes the accounting uh, standard prescribes certain disclosures that accounting policy for the measurement of inventory what are the method you are following and the carrying out of inventory then uh, whatever the expense whatever inventory you are because ultimately whatever the inventory other than finished good if it is raw material stores spare and consumable and in process also it is being expensed in the next cycle to be used in the manufacturing process to get the finished good so in sap accounting wherever there is a computerized accounting system if i am keeping an inventory in the, the this any inventory it is reduced or diluted or liquidated only in the form of expenditure accounting so that expenditure disclosure whatever inventory value you have recognized expenses you have to give a disclosure any amount you have written down in written of apne you know, inventory kuch kar diya either due to non moving or due to nrv anything you have written down then you have to give also a disclosure one important thing only uh, a last last ball item the carrying amount of inventory plays a security for liabilities if i have taken any cash credit or the working capital loan from the bank if any inventory if it is placed i must have to give a disclosure for that now the caro complaints are earlier also the caro complaints so that this is particularly the physical verification of the inventory so the caro complaints is that whether a physical verification inventory has been conducted at reasonable intervals or not and whether in the opinion of the auditor the coverage and procedure of such verification the management is appropriate and question is that whether any discrepancy of 10% or more in their aggregate or is class of inventory is class of inventory means raw material store space is in one group then in process and finished good so is class that we are taking then in is class if it is more than 10% then you have to give a effect in the books of accounts and second thing during any point of time of the year the, if the company has sanctioned any working capital limits then aggregate from banks or finance institution whether you are giving this quarterly returns to the banks that we have discussed that also mandated in the um, uh, as2 as a index to as a disclosure same thing has been also taken care in the caro complaints so this is the requirement i think with this much of uh, deliberation now we can leave time for question answer session yes sir yes sir uh okay can i read the question in chat box yeah please 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 yes sir sir first question is uh, how to measure ppe in case of exchange asset and deferred credit basis there are two aspect on it first is exchange of asset that means if i have understood the question correctly if it is exchange of asset that means i am giving one asset maybe current or maybe pp is it that exchange of asset means that i am giving one asset and in turn i am getting another asset that is the meaning or any other meaning the questioner can clarify what what do they want exactly what is the exchange Aros can sir is uh, is you there please uh, clarify the question Aros can sir Aros okay i am coming to that there is simply we will go by accounting version first of all if i have well, the way I'm, okay it is now mr sir has told that it is fixed asset exchange so first of all i am having one asset in my books of accounts okay i am giving you giving that asset and i am getting an a separate asset with of of a different value or of the same value there are these are two different transactions whatever the asset i am dispensing or removing from my books of accounts 
that must be derecognized. I suppose I am having a computer. Suppose I'll give the example of buyback. I think that will be the better uh, understanding. In my books of accounts, there are computers available, old computers. Whenever I have dealt with the contract vendor to purchase the new uh, computer machines, I have told, sir, you will take my old computers and you will give me the new computers. For the old computers, you will pay me this much of price, which I will be adjusting from the new computer price given by you. So in that case, if in, for any exchange of asset, the underlying condition is that first one asset you are dispensing from you. So one asset is to be derecognized, and the new asset, whatever you are getting, that will be with the full cost, not with the adjusted cost. For example, the existing computer, the old computers I'm having, that is the WDV of 2000 rupees. And the new computer that I'm getting, that is 80,000 rupees. So the old computer, I am whatever I'm disposing, I have to derecognize the value of 2000 rupees. And if the vendor agrees to pay 2000, there is no loss to it. And if there is, I'll come, Mr. Sir, I'll come to your answer afterwards, after this. Okay, so first, let us complete this first exchange asset. So, question is that if the original value is 2000 rupees in my books, the vendor agreed to pay 1000. So, another 1000 will be charged to the stipend of profit and loss in the year of disposal. Now, question comes the exchanged asset that I am getting, that is a new asset for me. The gross value or the unadjusted value, net of tax credit, must be, will be taken as an item of recognition with that value, with new item and new value, without any adjustment. Now, the second question is that deferred credit. Deferred credit has a significant impact in case in, particularly in index environment, because deferred credit, it becomes a payable to be settled on a later date, because there is an imputed interest involved. That means today, I am supposed to pay this much. Instead of paying today, I have deferred this payment over a period of five months, 10 months, EMI, something, something is there. So that means there is an imputed interest involved in that. That will be again considered as a part of financial instrument because that will be coming under payable under the terms of contract. But whatever the first thing I have to recognize that. And if there is any suppose deferred payment, somebody is giving free of cost. Again, deferred payment with additional interest cost. For the timing, let us assume that is free of cost. As because I am saving certain interest, that interest will be brought down with discounted value and will be adjusted with the value of the new asset that is likely to come. Next question, please. Uh, next question. Uh, can we use the asset even after it is being depreciated completely? 100%. 100%. Because two things are there. Take a, what the, either it is company chat or the company's management, you are deciding the estimated useful life. It is not actual useful life. The company that has mandated that the estimated use, you will decide the depreciable life based on the estimated useful life. Either the based on the OEM specification or by my industry experience or by taking the reference from the companies that are scheduled to life. So it is a estimated useful life. So estimated use by your actual life can exceed. So I have depreciated the asset based on the estimated useful life. So your estimated useful I can you you your requirement for use is a operational requirement. So it will not come in between. But for the better cause of the company, once if you are finding that your asset is fully depreciated, but you are expecting that asset will likely to continue for another significant years, less and less than 10 years. Where I, this estimated useful life, this year, 20 years, I have fully depreciated, or another 10 years ago, then you have to revisit the revaluation of each asset. But one thing you have to say, one-to-one -one asset you cannot make. If you are making a revaluation of each asset, then that particular class of asset you have to make revaluation. One pick and choose revaluation you cannot make. But if such group of asset exists, and you are finding that your balance useful life physically is still there, even after the asset is fully depreciated, then you can think for revaluation of your fixtures. 
and next question how to value inventories of service providers it is uh, in my, okay because uh, so far we have discussed uh, so far we have discussed the tangible part the service provider whatever it is coming normally again to the extent the amount spent in the service suppose i'll be telling i'll take the example of computer software service i have asked a computer um, agency or the software firm to develop a software for me it is a intangible item for me either it is a capital service or it is a revenue service so if i have asked a vendor to develop a software and that software takes substantial time it is not that all cost is uh, um, in um, provided at the year end day suppose 70% of the job is completed so to the extent whatever expenditure he has incurred till the date of reporting that much value will be reported for the purpose of that service inventory of that service thank you sir and next question sir asset cost is not exactly known at the time of recognition of asset and asset is capitalized based on estimated cost if subsequent addition to this asset what methods should be adopted whether depreciation is to be calculated in prospective or retrospective way two things are there first of all this is a standard practice yes it is correct because uh, if you see the major small purchase items it will not have an issue but if i there is a contract suppose a periodic mane ek long term contract ek 2 saal lag gaya ke project mein nahi to ek tonki project aap de rahe normally it takes substantial time to submit the final bill so unless and this submission of final bill is uh, subject to material reconciliation other compliances contract closure delay analysis all these uh, compliances are required there so it is a fact that the account standard mandates me then when the asset is ready for put to use then i'll capitalize it so what the participant has told yes it is very correct that based on the contract value or the based on the best estimate available with me i will capitalize that now question comes what will happen when the finality will be reached there may be a plus to the asset value or there may be a minus to the asset value if there is any plus or minus will be dealt along with that asset now the question is that whether it is a prospective or retrospective question is that what will be the now question is that what is the basic difference so far as implication in the profit and loss account is concerned if i am going by retrospective then all earlier year difference i am charging to the current year if i am going by prospective then jitna aapka value addition ho gaya either negative or positive i am deferring to the next three years but you have to define your accounting policy in my view it should be prospective only prospective but ending with life of the mother plants suppose the original asset you have capitalized with end life of 2025 after 5 years so to say you have got the final bill all finality you have reached about the final value so your this uh, subsequent whatever addition you have made to the asset its depreciable life should not exceed 25 because you cannot exceed the marginal life so all the values you have to consume within this end life whatever originally you have envisaged then it will not be any wrong and to that extent you can give a disclosure in your policy thank you sir the next question uh, how the asset should be recognized if it is purchased by foreign exchange currency and payment is yet to be made first two things first of all payment is a different part accounting recognition of the asset is a different part if you'll see the account standard for this uh, foreign exchange so what it is there is a transaction date there is a settlement date clear the foreign exchange the foreign exchange variation whatever you are telling there is a exchange gain and loss that is made available when you are comparing with the transaction date and the settling date what is the transaction date the date when i am trans recognizing the transaction in my books of accounts based on some authentic document so i have to create the asset based on the exchange rate applicable on the date of bill of entry or the goods entered into the india into the into the country or the port in india suppose 
one asset i am purchasing with 5000 dollar and the exchange rate it's 70 rupees on a particular date but i have not paid i will be recognizing that value on the applicable day of the transaction and please mind the transaction is not the as per your books of accounts the transaction is the date of bill of entry when the goods entered in the customs of india because otherwise i can differ on by one choice the date of transaction so date of that's why i'm telling the date of transaction must be accompanied by a document called bill of entry which is a authentic document when the consignment has crossed india so that date of transaction mein jo aapka exchange rate tha you will capitalize the asset or recognize the asset with that value and create a liability now suppose the date of payment differs whatever the difference comes from the date of recognition or the date of transaction and the date of payment the difference you will be taking to exchange variation loss and gain which will be part of profit and loss account thank you sir next question from niranjan mishra sir uh, whether uh, abnormal costs are part of conversion cost although it is part of financial statements in my view no because the very nature is abnormal it is not a part of your process because the accounting standard itself it is any wastage anything anything in the abnormal normally it should not form part of your operation or the operation cost it is abnormal it is not likely to happen so any abnormal cost should be reduced from the inventory valuation in the you'll, you'll see abnormal loss it is taken that's why i told normal loss is reported as a part of consumption expenditure in the statement of profit and loss account abnormal loss is taken as a part of administrative expenditure because i have not enjoyed the benefit of that item as because it is a loss i have to recognize in the books of accounts as a loss so as because that is not attributing to my production that should not form part of the cost of inventory thank you sir i think uh, all the questions uh, are taken care and uh, and uh, thank you sir for your nice presentation and uh, the good interaction session uh, now i request our secretary cms surjanaran tripathi sir kindly offer the formal vote of thanks thank you himo sir good evening to all join in the today Uh, we meet today resource person cma vk das sir yesterday resource person cma ram shankar misra sir tomorrow resource person cma dr gk raju sir and all other dignitaries senior members present on the today we meet our beloved chairman cma himoz misra sir chairman pd committee and past chairman of the chapter cma sakdeer singh sir and all the participants good evening to all i cma sujinaran tripathi secretary of the chapter feel honored to propose the formal vote of thanks i on behalf of the mc member of bhuvneshwar chapter and on my own behalf extending heartiest thanks to the today's resource person cma bk das sir for sharing very much informative qualitative and participative inputs with regards to index 2 inventories index 16 my special thanks to chairman and chairman pd sir for taking pain in conducting the three days series of we meet on indes in right time in spite of packed schedule my heartiest thanks and gratitude to cma niranjan misra sir who not only inspired us but also guiding us in every moment to conduct the activities of the chapter i convey my joyful thanks to all the participant who have participants um, who have participated on this two days um, three days uh, in this i am happy to express vote of thanks uh, to uh, on um, vote of thanks and um, uh, with the uh, give thanks to our uh, staff and chapter of the chapter for their effort and support all are requested to join in the same link tomorrow's uh, we meet uh, proposed by um, resource person uh, cma gk raju sir and thank you for all your
continued support and cooperation with this i hereby announce the closure of two days second day of the three days web meet series on indes um, indes thank you thank you all jai jagannath नमस्कार सर नमस्कार 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 आचार्य सर पढ़े निरंजन मिश्र सर आचार्य सर माय बेस्ट रिगार्ड्स नमस्कार 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 सर फेस देखा आचार्य सर बाहर हाँ सर एनी फर्दर क्वेरीज प्लीज नोट इट एंड पास ऑन टू मी कैन सर ओके थैंक यू बाय नमस्कार